So I promised you last time I preached, I was going to preach to you about the favor and blessings of God, and everybody wants to know how to be blessed, right? Amen? But I started studying, and I realized that God had a little bit more to say about breaking curses and about uh, leaving a legacy to your children and your children's children. I mean a godly legacy. I mean a legacy of blessing and favor rather than a legacy of blessing of curses and destruction, right? So we're going to do half and half. It's going to be a two-part because I was never able to get through it at any, either of the other services. Halfway is all I could get. So in a few weeks, I'm going to do part two. It's going to be all favor. But today, we're going to do some recap right here in the beginning. First of all, John 8, 31 tells us, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Which means there is a knowing aspect to the truth. A knowing in the Bible usually speaks of intimacy. And intimacy with God is is knowing God and intimacy with God. And if you know God, then you're going to know the truth. If you know the Word, then the truth that you know and you understand and you apply is the truth that sets you free. That's the only truth that can set you free. If you don't know it, understand it, and apply it. And Hosea... Uh, also tells us, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So we're looking for truth and knowledge here. Truth and knowledge here. Because you, God obviously wants you free. And He wants you to really believe when you walk out today that I'm going to make some changes. I have faith to do some changes. And you're going to have examined your family tree and be thinking about what's going on in your life and what part is good and what part is not. Because that is what God wants you to do this morning. And I believe I'm going to communicate that well with you. Um, I'm going to first of all give you two definitions to generational curses. One is my definition that I'll always give you, and another, I have a second one as well. Just so you completely understand, God's recompense or return in the life of a person and their descendants that is a result or a consequence of iniquity. A curse is a legal entry or doorway for demons. The second definition is, An iniquity that increases in strength from one generation to the next, affecting the members of the family and all who come into relationship with that family. So you see that the demons, it's a legal entry point for demons. Yes, a Christian can be not possessed, but oppressed by demons and multiple demons. I was, and it didn't mean that I was a crazy person. It just mean that I had lots of issues in different areas. How many know that a Christian can have issues? Yes, we have issues. That's why we come to church. That's why we, we're human beings. We are saved. But it is that point of salvation when God begins to do this amazing work in our lives that we all so desperately need. He takes us from death to life, from sin to, to righteousness. He takes us on that journey. Everything happens Because somewhere, someplace in your past, someone set something in motion. Everything happens because somebody somewhere in our past, in our ancestry, in our generations, set certain things in motion. Whether it's a sickness that the enemy wants passed down on you, whether it's a sin, whether somebody in your generations before you consulted a psychic or a witch, whether somebody was rebellion, rebellious, because that is the sin of witchcraft, amen, rebellion, the same sin as witchcraft, these things bring curses, and they're actually doorways for demons, and so this is how the enemy operates, and today I just want to expose this, Galatians 6, verse 7 through 9, don't be misled, you cannot mock the justice of God, you will always harvest what you plant. Not just in the financial realm, although seed time and how harvest is about the financial realm that pastor preaches you, Uh, but in every realm, you will always harvest what you plant. You will reap what you sow. 
Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit of God. Everlasting life. So let's not get tired of doing what is good or or just. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest, a blessing, if we don't give up. We're going to reap what we sow, no matter if we are saved or not. There is a spiritual cause and effect. You're going to reap what you sow. And so today, the message that I'm preaching to you is called legacy. The, co- the point I want commute- to communicate to you is how you can change your family tree or your legacy or what was passed down on you from the generations before, as Pastor Glenn did in his life, he has created a legacy of godliness and blessing, and us together, I have created as well, because in my generations were many, many Christians, but none of them were set free Christians. My dad actually got saved, really, in the last couple of years of his life, then got fulfilled with the Holy Spirit, and didn't really have that much time to start or have the truth. Or have the revelation that I'm preaching to you today. I am the first one in many, many, many generations of Christians, Sunday school teachers and missionaries and all alike, that got the truth of of being set free and what it can do and how and everything that was passed down on me, I have worked very, very hard to break of course, with the Holy Spirit. Of course, not in my own power, because you cannot break it in your own power. You have to have the Lord. So the message that I'm preaching to you today is called Legacy. And Legacy, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you will communicate through me this message, Lord, and that you will teach your people, God, what they need to know. God, you'll put that faith in their heart, Lord. You'll stir it up inside of them right now. They will have the faith to believe you today to make changes. As long as there's breath in our body and you on our side, God, and you in our lives, Lord, we can make the changes necessary to create the godly legacy and leave it for our children and our children's children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Legacy means something handed down from one generation to the next. There's a true story. There was a woman on her deathbed, and a friend of mine went to go visit her. And as she went to visit her, the woman said, I'm dying. I want you to pray for me. Uh, I know that I'm dying because my mother died when she was 67, and I am 67. And so my friend said to her, well, how old was your dad when he died? And, and she said, well, he's still alive. He's going strong at 86. And so as the friend began to pray, she began to pray that God would give this woman the faith to believe for her dad's genes instead of her mother's genes, and that the curse of premature death would be broken in Jesus' name. Then when she finished praying, she began to talk straight to the lady and said, I'm going to just tell you straight out right now, you need to believe for your dad's genes. You need to believe God. You have a lot left to give. You have a lot left to do for your children, your church, your city, and God has important things for you to do. And so this lady had a miracle. It was physical, it was spiritual, and it was emotional. All three, this miracle. And she began to believe that she would, should, and would, could live, and she did, and went on to declare the works of the Lord. Amen? This is true. Sometimes we give in to these curses, and uh, we think that that is it for us. Let me say the difference between transgression and iniquity. Transgression is a sin that is a one-time sin, not a habitual sin. It's if you sin, not when you sin. The Bible says if you sin, not when you sin. You have an advocate with the Father. And so a transgression is a sin. We're all going to sin. That's why Jesus 
shed his blood. He knew we would all be sinners. But iniquity is different. And notice this, that in both definitions of curses, it was the word iniquity, not the word sin or transgression. It was the word iniquity. What does iniquity mean? Iniquity means wickedness and Webster's. It also means a well-worn path, habitual practice sin. You cannot practice sin and, and expect to in, inherit the kingdom of God, it says so in Galatians 5. If you practice sin, your father is not God. He wants you to get free. The power is there for you to get free. God, Jesus paid the price for us to get free so you can be free. Amen? So we need to establish this. Does God want you blessed? Does he want you to prosper? Or does he want you to be sick and depressed and angry and rejected and unloved and fearful? What, is, what does that sound like? That doesn't sound like God, does it? God wants us to be blessed. And 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in every way and that your body may keep well even as your soul keeps well and prospers. There is a revelation in that scripture, and the revelation is simply this. If you can get your soul, your mind, will, and emotions to prosper, through the Word of God, that's how you get your mind, will, and emotions to prosper. It's, that, it's through this Word of God. Then your, everything else will follow in your life. As you begin to put the Word in, come to church, take notes, read your Word, pray. As you begin to do these things and re renew your mind with the Word of God, then your thinking begins to change. Everything else, your body will follow, everything else will follow. God will show you how to take care of yourself. Some of you need somebody like me, like Pastor Glenn has somebody like me in his life that knows, shows him how to... How to take care of himself. See, God kept him alive in, in 2009, and he kept him alive several times. It's been several times. Uh, so Holy Spirit, with, with me, came along and said, okay, now God kept you alive. Now we're going to listen to godly wisdom here, and we're going to do natural things not just drugs, but natural things. And when I say drugs, I'm not talking about drugs. I'm talking about medicine. <laughs> it's a better word, right? But they are drugs, hey. So you got to be careful with those, even when the doctor gives them, right? So we do natural things. We do things to take care of his heart. We don't let him eat certain things. We, we take the bacon away on some days and... Uh, try to buy the healthy stuff and make him a bag full of pills that are so big that he doesn't ever want to get them down. But he's listening to me and see, he's getting body prosperity because he has me as his wife. Three things you need to know. Uh, because you want to leave a less legacy, right? A positive legacy, a godly legacy, a legacy of blessing and favor instead of the curses, right? I know you do. You've got to say yes on that one. Come on, big yes. All right, three things you need to know. Number one, having God's best or leaving a godly legacy is not something you can accomplish on your own. Well, I think you kind of know that. But listen, sometimes we think we're saved. You know, you, you come to church, you think you're saved. You go to McDonald's, you don't think you're a hamburger. So you, you can't be saved by coming into this building. You have to make a decision and a choice. And that choice involves walking this aisle and confessing before man who you pledge your life to, who you're going to give your life to. Amen? Isn't that how we get saved? Confess and believe in our heart and confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So we do that out loud. You are God's creation before you get saved. You become God's child after you get saved. You become a son or a daughter. There are many privileges to being God's son or our daughter, 
But if you have a lot of disobedience and a lot of curses and a lot of sin and transgression and iniquity going on in your life, it's going to be hard for God to get these blessings and this legacy to you. He wants you to have, all the promises are yes and amen. You become a son or a daughter. You become an heir. Your DNA changes. I don't have my earthly father's DNA anymore. I, he, was, he was a sweet man, but he had many, many problems. And so you surrender your life. I'm going to give you salvation 101 right now. You walk down the aisle, you say a prayer, you mean it in your heart, you surrender your life to God. You don't come down here and get a ticket to go to heaven. There is no such thing as getting a ticket to go to heaven. You come down here because you want to give your life to God. You have decided to follow Jesus. You have decided to, die, to deny yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow him. You have decided to surrender your life to Jesus, and that includes your finances. That includes your time. That includes your energy. That includes your whole being. You have decided to surrender. There are all different levels of surrender. There's this little little bitty, a one foot in the door surrendered. That is not going to make God happy. You have to be all in. Either God is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. Lord of all or not Lord at all. Amen. And so you begin to change because he gives that heart of stone, he takes out, he gives you a heart of flesh, he begins to speak to you. At that point, you choose whether you want to follow him or not because you have free will after you become a Christian as well as before you have a Christian. He does not make you into a robot. You have to choose to obey him. It's with obedience that you get blessings. You should read it in Deut Deuteronomy. The blessings blessings come with obedience. The curses come with rebellion. So eradicate rebellion out of your life. Surrender your life to God. Start reading the Bible, coming to church. Chances are, if you come to church once a month, you might not be in relationship with the Lord God. You might be practicing religion. And we don't advocate religion around here. I know that might shock you. But it was the religious people that gave Jesus the most problem. Amen? So we don't want to be religious. We want to be in love with Jesus. That's what he wants. He loves us that much, we need to ask him to put that love in our heart. Or if that first love has gone, we need to ask him to rekindle it. We need to repent and turn around and walk in the other direction. In fact, that's what salvation is. You repent and you turn around and you walk in the other direction. You won't be the same because Jesus is in your heart unless you continue to say, I want to do things my way. You're still rebellious. And in that case, it's going to be a lot of pounding God's going to have to do to you to get your attention. He's going to pound, and he's going to pound, and he's going to pound. And it's t if you start reading the Word, you start praying, you come to Monday House of Prayer because you know you're going to learn how to pray. You've got to learn how to pray with authority. Some of you are getting beat up. How many of you know you're in a battle because you're getting beat up? All right? So you've got authority. Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I've given you power and authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall harm you. But you've got to take your authority. You've got to figure out who you are in Christ, who he sees you to be, what your gifting is. And one other thing, I don't believe that Christians that are in love with God and full of the Holy Ghost will just ever want to warm a pew. You will want to serve God. You will want to get involved. And you can start with the classes until you mature some, but you know what? It's not long before God's going to say, it's time to serve. I remember I wasn't anywhere close to being set free from fear. And my first baby, Kelly, was 10 months old, and she had been really sick for 10 months old, for the whole 10 months. And God said to me, if you want to wait until everything's perfect in your life to start serving, then you will never, 
ever serve. And I started in the nursery because I was too fearful to do anything else. In fact, I was nervous around the two-year-olds. And this was 1977. It was a long time ago. It was 1977. But you know what? I did it. Some of you need to learn that you're going to have to step out to to please God. I want to please God. I want to please God. And I know I'm a straight preacher, but that's just who I am. And uh, the truth is what's going to set you free. And really genuinely in my heart, I just want you to know truth. God wants you to know it. He wants you to make choices today and look in your family tree and see what's going on. And what characteristics are going what are you, What are your issues? What are things are still there? Because if you don't get rid of them, they're going to grow and they're going to grow and they're going to grow and they're going to overcome you. And literally, it's going, it's going to get the best of you if you don't Take authority now, if you don't choose now, if you don't repent now, if you don't make a choice now, because God, when he's with you, and some of you need the Holy Spirit, some of you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, come on, why are you trying to live this life without power? You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are two separate baptisms. Read about it in Acts. There's not just water baptism. We got to be baptized by fire in the Holy Ghost if we want any power. And we are going to need power, all right? So the second thing we need to know is we need to establish establish a godly legacy and generational blessing that is passed down to the next generation. It's a supernatural act of faith. You cannot please God if you do not have faith. It's in Hebrews. Uh, for with, for without faith, it is impossible to please God or be satisfactory to Him. For whoever believes in Him must believe that He exists and He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I have not read that one lately. Without faith, it is impossible to please or be satisfactory to God. It, you have to have faith. Faith is like a muscle. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So you need to start using your faith muscle now against the things that are in your life, just like the lady, the story I told you, had to believe God for her father's genes. I am choosing to believe, even though I'm very much like my mother, that I will not get Parkinson's disease. She's suffered with it for 13 years now. She's 93 years old. She's worked out her whole life. She's taking care of herself. So in Jesus' name, I break that generational curse, just like Pastor is breaking the generational curse of heart disease and premature death because it skipped his dad's generation, thank God, because he didn't get saved until he was uh, just right before he died. But the, it, he would have died in his 50s. The generation where his, his mother and his sisters, they all dropped dead around 58. And I believe you were 58 in 2009. I don't know. I don't know. How old were you in 2009? Anyway, <laughs> the curse was trying to kill him. The curse of heart disease was trying to kill him. Okay, guys, that was not a joke. I'm glad I'm making you laugh, but that was not a joke. Okay, so the third third, third thing that you need to know, only this is something you need to do. (sighs) Examine your life This is what I want you to do, guys. I want you to start doing it right now. Examine your life and your family tree to see what needs to change to establish a godly legacy. Be thinking right now while I show you a negative tree. I'll show you what it looks like. All right? There's a negative tree. Let's start at the bottom. Poverty, addiction, strife, sins of the tongue, gossip, hate, idolatry, divorce, incest, adultery, death, suicide, fear, rejection, witchcraft, rebellion, pride, murder, anger, hate, whatever premature death, defeat and failure. There are a lot of curses, Uh, incest, rape, 
molestation. There are a lot of ways the enemy tries to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. We live in this fallen world. That's why Jesus came. But at the point of salvation, you can't believe that it's all going to just Presto changeo. Yes, a lot happens at the point of salvation. God gets you on the right track and you begin to change and some things do change just like that. And other things are a process. How many of you know other things are a process? Can I tell you about my walk with fear? Can I tell you about a lifelong battle? Really, with fear? Because it likes to show up in other ways. It likes to come creeping around still. I mean, yes, I'm free, but what I'm saying is that the enemy is always trying to come back on you. And if there's a time when you leave yourself open and you, you're maybe doing some sin and you ha- you're not in the Word, not even in the Word, you're not walking close with God, you're not walking in the Holy Spirit, then these things can come back on you. Only if you turn your back on God will they completely come back on you. But they want to, and you got to get back in the Word and get back knowing and doing what you know to do is right. Always moving forward, because if you're not moving forward, you're stuck, you're stagnant, and it's called religion, and it's not relationship. And religion is from the pit of hell, because it's rules and regulations that we cannot keep. It's why Jesus came. The Ten Commandments. We, they're important. We shouldn't take the Ten Commandments off the school walls. They're still important. But you know what? We can't live the Ten Commandments without Jesus. We couldn't do it. We can't do it on our own. Jesus had to come. And if we were to try, even as Spirit-filled believers, we would still sin and fall short of the glory of God. But we don't have to practice sin. You know, Jesus had a family tree as well. Jesus had an earthly family, right? Mary's side, right? Okay, so you want to see what's in Jesus' family tree that he had to overcome? We think Jesus, oh, son of God. He came down here. Everything was perfect. Everything was easy for him. I I suggest to you that no, he had to live a perfect, sinless life. But maybe it wasn't as easy as we thought it was. Look what was in his family tree. Judah and Tamar had incest. Rahab was a harlot. Ruth was a Moabite. David was an adulterer and murderer. Solomon, a polygamist. Ligamus and Naaman sacrificed to carve idols. That was in Jesus' family tree. Hey, what's in your family tree? You know, what's, what does a positive family tree look like? Let's look at that one. All right. What, this is what you want your family tree, to your legacy to pass down. Instead of pride, there's humility. Instead of harshness, there's gentleness. Instead of impatience, there's patience. Instead of rebellion, there's obedience. Instead of fear, there's a sound mind and power and love. Instead of for, uh, unforgiveness and bitterness, there's forgiveness. Instead of selfishness, there's selflessness. Instead of belittling and talking down and being being destructive in our words, there's encouragement. Instead of no self-control and being out of control, there is self-control. Instead of uh, being mean and cruel and bad, there's goodness. Instead of chaos, there's peace. Instead of depression, there's joy and there's hope for a life that is going to be better and better and better. Your best days are ahead of you. Your best days are ahead of you. Kelly, Christy, and Micah, all three had little battles with fear and rejection because I had such big battles with them. While I was getting set free, Kelly was already 13 years old. She was in the eighth grade. At her eighth grade graduation, she had to speak in the microphone, and it made her very, very scared. And I could see some of the same expressions of fear manifest in her face that always did on mine, and it made me so mad. And even though I wasn't set free yet, I began to take authority, because I was going through my process during that time in the early 80s. 
90s, and I began to take authority over this thing, and her battle with fear it was pales in comparison to my battle. Christy, she had a little battle with fear as well. She was 13 when she began to sing. We did not know she had a beautiful voice until she was 13, and 14, she's developing this gift, and 15, and 16, she's trying to sing with the choir up here on stage before, you know, thousands of people. And I remember one particular Sunday when she didn't do as well as she thought she should do. And she was so upset and ran off the stage crying. And I said, no, devil, she is going to get through this. She's going to be powerfully authoritative. And she is. And Kelly is as well. And then in the seventh grade, at this time, while Micah was in the seventh grade, I was definitely on fire for God and definitely knew I had authority and definitely killed the devil when he tried to do stuff to my children. And so when Micah came home in the seventh grade saying some things that had happened to me at the seventh grade, exactly the same age at 13, that vulnerable age of 13, I said, no, devil, don't you even think about it, and tore him up one side and down the other every day for seven days. I tore, I ripped that spirit into shreds. I was so mad. And in seven days, this is the quickest one, in seven days, I began to hear different things come out of my child's mouth to where that I knew that I knew that that wasn't happening to him anymore. Now, Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38 says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So we're going to go back to a minute, just a minute, to all your heart, how much you have to love God. He wants all. There it is, right there. He wants all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And the next scripture, 1 John, whatever, 5, 3. First John, but loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome to you. So we have, if we, if we say we love God, then we're going to keep his commandments. That means we're not going to do anything on purpose that grieves the Holy Spirit. If you have a stronghold and you cannot stop on your own this sin, and it's habitual, and it's practice, and it's iniquity, and it's going to be passed down then you need to get to this altar. I have trained altar workers. We have healing rooms from 2 to 5 every Tuesday in room 115. You can have private appointments there. You can call my secretary, and we have teams of people that will pray in our healing and deliverance for you in a private setting. There are many opportunities that we give you. Monday House of Prayer is a great place for the altar workers to pray for you. There are many ways, but you better go after it. You better get in the Word, and you better not let it continue to operate in your life unless you want to see it destroy your life. Amen? First John 3, 7 through 10. Deal to your children. Don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what it, it is right, what is right, it shows they are righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows they belong to the devil. Now, these are not my words. These are the scripture. So God is a lot harder than I am. Amen? Okay, next verse. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. So if you're practicing sin... You need to look at that and do what I just told you a minute ago because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. It's very straight. It's very plain. It's very clear. God wants you to examine your life and examine what's been passed down on you. And he wants the change to start with you. If it hadn't started with your generations before, it can start with you. And how cool would that be if you know, when, when you find out and you realize that you did the hard work of getting free in an area that you were bound in, like me with the fear and rejection. If you 
you feel so good. And it's not a pride thing. It's a thing of, I have conquered with Jesus. I am more than a conqueror. And I have conquered this area of my life that I had for 36 plus whatever years that so overtook my life that I was not even really able to live a normal life. But you feel so good about it. Why not start with you? Why not be the one to be the catalyst for change in your family? If it's been passed down on you, then you know what? You're going to break it, right? You're going to determine in your heart. You're not going to practice sin. You're not going to have be flirting with girls when you're married. You're not going to be on the computer looking at porn late at night when your wife or your husband is asleep. You're going to stop doing these things. You're not going to shoplift. You're not going to lie. You're not going to steal. You're not going to blame. You're not going to accuse. You're not going to gossip. You're not going to manipulate. You're not going to control. You're not going to have outbursts of anger. It's time for it to stop. Say this with me. (laughs) It stops with me. Amen. All right. The next scripture, 1 John 3, 3 through 6. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. God's word. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. This literally is the part where I transition into the favor, how to be blessed, how to be favored from, of God. You can be blessed and highly favored. I can remember one time years ago, I was going through some really, really hard things. And in my carnal mind at that moment of weakness, and attack and everything, I said, everything I've done to follow you, God, just hasn't meant anything. And God interrupted my thoughts so fast. And he said, no matter what I was going through, he said, you are blessed and highly favored. And I have never forgotten that because no matter what I go through, I'm still blessed and highly favored. He knew. He knows what you're going through. Can you stand? He knows what you're going through right now. He knows the things that you're practicing that are sinful, that have become iniquity. He knows the things that have been passed down on you. He knows the things that you'll pass down on your children. And so today is the day of first salvation. And I want everyone under the sound of my voice to close their eyes. And I want my altar workers to get up here really quick. And I want you to think about, are you truly saved? Have you really had a heart change? Are the commandments of God burdensome to you? Can you feel like you can't live this life? Are you trying to do it on your own strength and in your own power? Do you need to rededicate your life to God? Do you need to give your life really fully? Do you need to surrender your life to God with every eye closed? I pray right now that you will raise your hand if you need to give your life to God. If you need to rededicate your life to God, you will need to walk this aisle. You will need to make a step of boldness. Besides, it is an incredible advantage, uh, opportunity, blessing blessing, however you want to call, living for God, salvation, incredible advantage. Why would we be ashamed of Jesus Christ? Oh yeah, the world hates him. Oh yeah, the world hates him. He hate, they hate everything about him. I'm like, what could they have found wrong with Jesus? He healed everybody he went. He cared for everyone. The, what Everything he did, how could they have hated him the way that he did? So there's no way that we should be ashamed to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So right now in this, I want you to close your eyes. Once again, close your eyes and let those come down this aisle right now that want to receive God as your Lord and as your Savior, or you want to rededicate, or you want to say, you know what? I have got to get back on the right track because I have gotten off track. Anybody like that in this place? And it's okay. It's okay. 
There's no condemnation. We actually love you very much. We're actually very proud of you. Now, come on. Let them out of the pew and let them come on down. There you go. Come on, let's clap for them because we're proud of them. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. The second thing is you must choose to break these things, these issues, these cycles, these patterns, these iniquities. How many of you are ready to do that? I want you to come out of your pew and come down as many as can. We have a lot of altar workers today. Come on, you're sick of it. They know how to pray for you. I've trained them. They know how to pray for you. They know how to get, you'll have a supernatural experience with God. If you will walk down, come on, today, it's time to get rid of fear. Today, it's time to get rid of rejection. Today is the day God wants you to be set free. This one's getting saved. You guys, this one's, connect with him. Melvin, this one's getting saved, right? Praise God. Make sure you're connected with him. Anybody else? You tired of it? You sick of it? All right, come on down. You sick of it? You'll come get help, right? If you get sick enough of it, you'll come get help. You'll, Jesus, I need help. I don't care what anybody thinks. I need help. Amen? All right, the rest of you, put your hand on your heart. Say, Lord, today I choose to examine my life. If there's any wickedness, if there's any iniquity, I repent of it, ask you to forgive me, and I turn from it. I ask you to help me, Lord. I ask you to deliver me, Lord. I choose your path and your way and your kingdom this morning. I'm tired of trying to do things on my own. I choose you. Forgive me of my sins. I know you sent Jesus to die on a cross for my sins, and I receive that forgiveness right now. I surrender my life. I don't hold on. I deny my flesh. I follow you. It's not my will. It's your will. Be done in my life. I mean it, Lord. If you, you want me to serve, you want me to serve. So Lord, tell me where to start. And I promise I will obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.